so I'm going to start there. Um, the Igbo, the Afriko word for gratitude is ka, so you will hear that. Ka, Frankie, Awam, Elliot, Lisa, Maria, Gifty, NYU Ghana, NYU Abu Dhabi. The literal numbers, hundreds it seems, of people work in the sound system, work in the cameras, the food, the coffee, the security, the transportation, ka. To the writers here, published or not, who inspire, challenge, contradict, and disturb the creative process, unoka. And everyone who has sat in this mind-bending heat to listen to writers, unoka. And to the diplomatic corps who have come out always to welcome us, unoka. Ghana, go. I will start with an Ifa verse in Yoruba. Uh, we're not Africa, so we should speak more languages from here. The verse, in a way, sums up everything we need to know about the writer's struggle. The unfortunate thing is I have to sing it, so bear with me. That's not so pleasant for you. Awodo yigi yigi, hota omi yo. Awodo yigi yigi, hota omi. Awodo yigi yigi, awokumo. Awodo yigi yigi, hota omi. Afari bale adiki o afari bale adiki afari bale awo kumo afari bale adiki is it the water that shapes the stone at the bottom of the river or the stone at the bottom of the river that shapes the water this is the mystery we come to bow before every day we will never know the answer whether the water shapes the river, or the river shapes the stone, or the stone shapes the river. And it is because we will never know that we sit with the mystery every day, and even more questions bloom in us. Everyone forgets that Icarus also flew. Jack Gilbert, one. Writing and change are broad subjects, and since we don't have a lot of time, I will limit this more to a series of provocations, perhaps, that can be unpacked in conversation and over time. Most of us who write in our early careers think of our work as somehow being able to change, if not the world, then at least our small corner of it. It is a sweet naivete that fades as we realize how sentimental and self-indulgent it is, and how this very urge reduces the work in scope, ambition, and value. This desire to point our work at ground, grand outcomes is understandable, especially for writers in Africa, given the extreme pressures that confront us. The texture of this sort of desire we can call perception, that unique way of seeing and understanding that is available only to us as individuals. There is no advantage to this as a writer attempts to his work because this bends a larger possibility toward a smaller one. Perspective is a better path the art of seeing as best as we can from outside our perception. This is the first step to a robust conversation because whatever else we subscribe to, we can at least agree that the aim of writing is to be read. Two, can writing create the vortices of change? Yes, and yet context is needed. There is the internal change that can happen to a reader, but again, if seen from perception only, then we think the change in our psyche while specific, is a universal experience. It is, and it isn't. It is shared only in the sense that, as meaning-making animals, humans instinctively, led perhaps in proportion to a writer's craft, arrange words into lived realities. This experience is not shared as an objective and verifiable one that all of us have access to, but is experienced internally and then approximated externally. Most writers come to making through being readers, but to be really effective as a writer, you have to step behind the illusion of story to become the manipulator of story. Readers are always the innocents in this game, and the writer is the ruthless one. So, the change that literature can enact is often small and singular, and yet in an odd way, it becomes longer lasting and more powerful than any idea of mass change, which is often driven by ideology which in itself cannot have a profound psychological shift. There is, of course, external change, but this lies more in the committed curation of space 
than in writing itself. As has been mentioned, Kwame Dawes and myself, over the shared belief that African writers are the curators of African humanity, and by that I mean what gets left out of the simple narratives have created and sustained for 10 years the African Poetry Book Fund, with the aim of publishing continental and diasporic poets with the idea that more African writers that fill the world, the more varied and amplified narratives will be and will inevitably drown out much of the ill-informed noise that the media produces. Over 120 books and poets later, and the reintroduction of poets whose work has slipped from public consciousness, including the amazing, Kuf amazing Kufi Awano and Ama Ataido, I can say there has been change, measurable and quantifiable change. You saw them reading today. And for this, many of us, again, have to thank Ghana, because this thing we made requires a pool of very successful and very busy African writers to volunteer as editors, writers of forwards, even writing checks, which I think is the most talented form of writing. <laughs> <laughs> and they come gleefully to this work, because at the heart of this enterprise is the gift of Pan-Africanism, a dream Nkrumah enabled us to dream. And so it seems fitting that UNESCO recognizes Ghana's role in literature this year. Three, all agree that it began with tracing an outline around a man's shadow, Pliny the Elder. The quote above comes from a larger piece within Pliny the Elder's book, Natural History, and alludes to Pliny's attempts to trace the mythical origin of sculpture as an art form, its very conception, when allegedly a potter's daughter traced a human figure on a wall from its shadow and began to mold a clay form from it. The myth, as Pliny recounts it, locates the impetus to make this work, this mark, to capture this shadow in the fact that a potter's daughter's lover was leaving to go abroad, perhaps to fight a war, that much remains obscured. So it seems that the desire to make art, to draw the limits of the body, to create a simulacrum has its roots more in loss, or at least the possibility of loss. The need to remember, to create or recreate a body out of loss, but also against loss and against forgetting, is what drives many artists. This intervention in the world is repeated through time and culture and place, regardless of the truth of this or any myth. It can be argued that all art is, in fact, the reclamation of a primordial loss. This raises the specter of art as witness. Four, it was not night, not even when the darkness came, W.S. Merwin. When we speak of art given witness, we usually mean that we are attempting to give form, address, or visibility to things that are often inexpressible, such as the effects of joy and happiness, terror, pain, destruction, and erasure. In this way, the idea of witness, of testimony, is seldom, if ever, linked to things that are wholesome in our cultures. We give testimony, it seems, to unveil the hidden, to restore the wished away, the instinct towards the erasure of shame. To give witness is to create a common body of remembrance, one we can all share in, but beyond that, one that can and must necessarily offer us some kind of catharsis. And this is what art strives to do, to build this body out of shared fears and triumphs and desires, a nostalgia, as it were, for something that maybe never existed. This is both the triumph and the problem with art. It cannot speak of essential truths, if there are even such things, or even relative truths, for that matter. It can only speak in approximation, because this is what would allow everyone into the conversation. This is something writers have always known, because the truth, of course, is that we can never feel each other's pain, but only approach it by relating it in degrees to our own. To paraphrase Jimmy Baldwin, your suffering means something only in so much as it can connect to the suffering of others. This trade in a mutual loss bridges the distance between self and other. Every artist knows that art is a weak vehicle for addressing loss in all its magnitude, and yet it is the most durable, the most reliable one we have. In this way, the witness of art transcends mere testimony mere accounting, mere reportage, to define a space that allows for surrender and resistance to occur at once. That witness works at all is a small miracle. A miracle of what, you might ask? In the oblique way that much truth happens, this is in fact a kind of love. 
and I mean this in the sense that Schoenke in his essays and plays does. The idea that any kind of honest interaction between people requires the relinquishing of parts of the self to each other. Witness is an act of love, not in the sentimental, although that is certainly part of it. What I mean by love is the act of seeing. And why is seeing an act of love? It is perhaps the only true act of love. When, when we see, we slow the world down, bring it into focus, even for a moment, allow both object and subject to have sight and imbue everything with worth and value while also actively resisting its erasure. But more than that, seeing requires not turning away from difficulty to the safety of comfort. The scene is accompanied by lingering, the first slows everything down, and the lingering creates layers, a thickness, a mass that sits in our consciousness without threat, even if it does reek of menace. And this in turn allows us to approach by degrees the violence of any event and the damage it leaves behind. The distance between seeing and the mass and the telling is the impossibility of expression. And this is conversely and paradoxically the very power of witness. My own personal experience tells me that violence and even joy disrupts our balance, creates a feeling of vertigo, the sense that everything clear about our morality, our ethics, and about our worldview is spinning out of orbit so fast we can barely keep up. For most of us, art is the only way to arrest the speed of disintegration, to step back and get a hold of the fragments. Like when you break a vase and take a step back, you see at once the detail of pieces and the whole vase. And slowly you bend, pick up the first piece, and consider it. This is witness. That is to say that it is not the spectacle of the violence or even joy that we seek to show as writers, but its erasure of everything, including itself. Five, they say it's the iron in the blood that resists transformation, more in Seton. The problem, of course, is that witness cannot save lives directly or even alter the course of current events necessarily. We know this. Think, if you will, of Ngugi Wathiongo's play, The Trial of Dedankimathi. This play ends in much the same way as it begins in pretty much the same tradition as Chekhov. It goes through the exploration of loss, of tragedy, of mystery, and yet in the end it all cycles back. No grand change has happened, no great revelation occurs, and so we ask, what is the point? And perhaps that is precisely the point that we must ask. Perhaps this is the most powerful act of rebellion there can be. Perhaps this is the change that we don't act so sorry, here we go. <laughs> that we don't so easily accept what we hear or what we read, and that we ask always why and what if, and surely not, or sometimes a simpler call, hell no. Being a writer is a struggle to ring meaning to ring value, to redeem even the most unredeemable thing, to find transformation in even the most heinous moments, to prove through a very complex and sophisticated telling that every life can and does and in fact must have value. The very sun, I tell you, will rise for nothing less. Thank you. Hello everyone. How are we feeling? It's day three, right? Are, are we, are we, we still have some energy left. Yeah. Welcome, Dr. Chris Avani. Dr. Professor. Um, it's really interesting, you know, your, your keynotes and you set up these provocations. And I'm very interested in the idea around when you said, you know, um, this this sort of preoccupation that we have with change as writers or as creative people um, can sometimes be sentimental and self-indulgent. 
um, and how this urge that we've kind of <laughs> belabored ourselves with um, can kind of minimize the, the scope of the work. And I wanted you to kind of like expand on that. Okay. Oh, thank you. So we're starting with the soft questions. <laughs> All right. <laughs> wanna, wanna. Okay. So here's the thing. The way, I, the way I'm using sentimentality, have you ever seen a Steven Spielberg movie? And it tells you how to feel all the way through. That is what sentimentality is. The need to create one meaning, to lock everything into one potential experience, or at least to validate only one experience. So automatically that reduces the scope of work because, you know, um, all my publishers, every editor I've had, I don't know if they talk to each other, but I'm called the Geeks and Freaks guy because I write really difficult literature. It's not sentimental. It can't be turned away from, but it, is, it can stabilize the reader. So really, I think the scope, of, the scope of writing is quite simple. At first, it seemed very big. The trick is really, um, in one way, <laughs> Writing is idealized gossip, right? So, so you have to get people interested in talking about shit. And so, and the second part of it is that all write, all books, all literature is engaged only with one thing, which is to excavate what is human about us in juxtaposition with the world. And in fact, I don't believe that language evolves to communicate. I think communication is a byproduct of language. I think that language evolves for us to figure out who we are in relation to this rock, this tree, this other person. It is really a, a process of philosophical self-inquiry. And we know, I, I suspect I may be right, because some languages, unfortunately, like English, because it is the language of trade, world trade, mm. is entirely a transactional language. English has no philosophical potential. We try to bend it. It's a hard, that's why you can, hear, you can hear an opera in Italian, and you can read all things into it, and you hear an opera in English, and you just wince all the way through. Um, so it's sort of one, one when, when the work is a one-to-one -one relationship, then the work is entirely transactional. And transactional things hold little value. Um, ask any diplomat, right? <laughs> and, so, and so what you're trying to do is to, to create a, a complex form of layering. And so if you take Toni Morrison's Beloved, which is this terrible story about a woman who kills her own child rather than let the child go back into slavery, it's written so that you could read it on a plane and it would be like a Stephen King novel, just a horror story. And you read it deeper and it's layered with feminism, it's layered with history, it's layered with the relationship of the human body. In fact, that the story structure itself is a structure of a tree. So constantly, writers are trying to create work that can exist outside of their own intention. Um, and when you confront translation as a writer, I think you see that more, more readily. Um, so let me stop there. Otherwise, you know, Nigerians will just keep talking. Exactly. Um, but I mean, you know, I think what you say also brings me to this idea around writers and meaning making. Um, and I feel like, again, part of your keynote and what you've spoken about is also demystifying or, you know, just myth busting this writer as sage and oracle, right? Um, and I, I want to connect this to your own work. A lot of writers are always preoccupied with, you know, throughout the different sort of genres of their work and, you know, the ways in which their works exist, they're always preoccupied with something. Um, so what, are you, what have you been trying to make meaning of in all your work when in you think about it? It's really odd because I'm trying to see, look at her and look at you at the same time. Um, maybe, should you want to sit there? Okay. okay. Yeah, then, 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 then we look at each other. Yeah, then I don't feel so schizophrenic, <laughs> um, which is already my natural state. So, um, okay. Um, I am completely uninterested in the romanticism of writers, right? Uh, I teach writing, and you know, you constantly hear all the time, talent, talent. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there's no such thing as talent. Writing is a skill, you do it well, or you don't. 
it's like boxing. As Mike Tyson used to say, everyone has an opinion until they get punched in the face. <laughs> everyone can write a book until an editor walks into the material. So I think that people, writers cultivate visions. They, and, and all of those visions are based around questions. And some questions can drive an entire career. Uh, again, if we're talking about Toni Morrison, I, I use her because she, or, or even actually, in fact, we can talk about, but for, for Toni, her question largely seems to be, how is love simultaneously the most creative force and destructive force in the universe? So if you read Beloved, it, uh, it's a story about the terror of love. If you read uh, The Bluest Eye, it's about self-loathing. Like everything she does are all these different aspects. If you read Song of Solomon, it's love as history and, and, and so on and so forth. So for me, the question is always, how do we become what we become? Once you've become it, I lose interest as a writer, because I think that's, that's not so interesting. So it's not by mistake that almost every character I write about is 16 to 18, or on a big cusp like uh, Black in the Virgin of Flames, who wants to be a woman, can't face it, and then blacks out and dresses up as the Virgin Mary and appears all over Los Angeles. So I'm always interested in the liminal space. In fact, uh, one day I was talking to Wale about my work, and he called my aesthetics Koro. Aesthetics. Koro means alleyway in Europe. So I occupy that space against forgetting. And my job, I feel, is to take the most insignificant person and turn them into an epic hero without sentimentality. So, but then where, where and maybe this is personal, I don't know, but where does this preoccupation with becoming come from for you? Well, if I knew that, I would, I would probably not be writing anymore. I think that even you can't know the answer. Um, but okay, here's the thing. Even if you look at my, I'm, I'm biracial, I'm part English, I'm part uh, Igbo. Um, I don't like half and half because what half? You know, because then that could be problematic. Because as a black man, you don't want your lower half to be English. And so, <laughs> but, um, but then, but then I, it's sort of, so I'm always sort of curious about, the thing is, uh, nothing, people like to think that there is an a priori world. There is an object world, but every world is a story. And so everything exists within story. And so everything people, I also work as a, as a therapist in a way, and every time you talk to people, they say, but that's just how I am. I was like, no, that's just how you say you are. Everything you know about yourself is largely a story you've told yourself. And stories change and mutate, and you know, you know, if you're a writer, then they get even more grandiose. And, um, so I'm really interested in unraveling uh, to something more essential to something possibly uh, before that. So I think that my lived experience, I've, I've gone to school on three continents, I've taught in about six continents, I live in multiple languages, and so the question then of becoming is fascinating to me. Uh, I talked to a therapist who told me the reason I do this is because I have a trauma block from being a teenager. Who knows? They, you know, there are people who say anything if you pay them 150 bucks, so. I don't know. You also started your um, keynote with an, a verse from Modwifa um, recital. Um, and you're, of course, a babalao yourself as well. And so you exist in these spaces of, of liminality, spirituality. Um, and I think, and even the use that you talk about, like language, multiple languages as well. And I'm very interested in how that what sort of intersection or influence that has on the way you write or the way that you create? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there are two things, there are multiple ways we become writers. One of the things writers don't talk about is their families, right? Because we try to respect their privacy. But there is nobody who is successful as an artist who doesn't come out of a family of artists who didn't pursue it to the end, right? You, you were kind of, I mean, I published my first novel at 16. Um, so already there's privilege, um, but it's sort of, I couldn't type, so I would write longhand and my poor mother had to type everything. 
but it's sort of you you exist in a framework where people haven't said no to, to in a way um, so you owe parts of yourself because so much of what becomes you is sort of what you steal from your siblings um, what you pretend that they don't know all these kinds of things so that's part of it but the other part is so there's multiple languages so Charles is here, big ambassador. I'm, I'm going to disgrace him now by telling some secrets. But, so I used to break into Charles. Charles is six years older than me. I used to break into Charles's room, which was forbidden as a kid, because Charles had all the Jackson records, all the James Brown records. My Mark was, he was not cool. Charles was a cool sibling. And, and Charles had all the platform shoes. This is the 70s, so I would break in, wear Charles's clothes while he was out and listen to records. And so I found a, what I thought was Charles's diary, and I started reading it, and I was like, wait, this is a really amazing novel. And so I took it to my mom, I was like, did you know Charles was writing a novel? <laughs> and she, she looked at it, she read it, and she laughed, and she said, this is not Charles's novel. It turned out Charles had hand copied Things Fall Apart into his diary to, imp to impress women. But, <laughs> but, but, the thing is that I, all these intersections, that was the same summer I read Baldwin's Another, I was 10. Same summer I read Baldwin's Another Country, same summer I read the particular Silver Surfer Omnibus, the same summer I read uh, uh, Crime and Punishment, and then this encounter with, with Charles. So it's not only the linguistic structures, right? It's how different artifacts and experiences come together to open up the potential. Because after that, I wrote my first short story, which then got published, Nepotism, in the paper my mother worked for. <laughs> so there's that. Nepo little, baby. Yeah, so you're always working under multiple influences. I grew up speaking English, in English from England. Now I live in America, where they think they speak English. You know, my, mom, <laughs> my mother came on holiday once, and we were at the restaurant, and Chad was our server. And Chad was like, we have like the wasabi, like crusted salmon, like, and so when he left, my mother said, what on earth did he say? And so I told her, she said, well, what language is he speaking? And I said, English, well, and she went, oh, these Americans, we gave them a language, I wish they would use it. So, so there are multiple Englishes, there's Pigeon English, there's that English, there's American English, there's Igbo, there's Yoruba, which I'm, I had to learn as a Babalao. Uh, Charles went to school in the north and spoke Hausa, so then I'm picking up how. So you're, the, the, thing, the thing that makes a writer is that you are the sponge that soaks everything in, and there's something about you that is an interpretive matrix that then spews it out in a particular kind of organized way, and I think that's really what it is. And so even as I, when I'm in Ghana, I absorb things, um, and so then all these things become part of it. So the multiple languages, multiple registers, but this is what I personally believe, that an entire culture, everything about that culture, which is their worldview, is embedded in the language of that culture. So if you want to access that culture, you have to know the language of that culture. There's no shortcut. You can have approximations, yeah. but if you don't have it, you don't have it. There are words I say in Igbo, just one word, and then I can write a 20-page essay unpacking that one word. So it's a little bit more, so that's the thing, and it's the same if you write in English and so on and so forth. So I don't know if I answered the question, I just rambled everywhere. Yeah, um, you didn't go specifically around the spirituality. Oh, spirituality, and, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not a hard question to answer. I just tried to work in how I could shame Charles in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, so spirituality, this is a big word that means nothing. Okay. It's, a, it's spirituality is like authenticity. That's also an empty word. Because authenticity means nothing. It can't mean anything, it's ephemera. So spirituality really is a catch-all phrase because you'll find religion under spirituality, which I think, I think religion is a language of an aspect of humans trying to desperately make meaning in a sometimes very random world. So it's a language. It's a language of a part of our emotional matrix. It's a, it's a deeply psychological thing. So in, particularly in Yoruba and also in Igbo spirituality. So in Yoruba, the word for person is a neon. Neon means the conscious ones. And so when you're in Yoruba context and you're not behaving uh, in this conscious way, then they call you a ranko, 
which means animal, wild animal, bush animal. So really, within all African spirituality is the understanding that it is what we're trying to attempt is a journey from instinct and compulsion to awareness and, and sort of control. So you go from reacting to responding. And so the drive of it all is to become integrated within all the aspects of your own human complex, the possibilities, before there's a discussion of deities. So only non-practitioners talk about deities. They're not deities, they're, they're aspects of human consciousness, which is so large and hard to wrap your head around that you externalize them in a shrine form so that you can gain some vector uh, relationship to them. So for me, all journeys of spirituality, and particularly the one I'm on, is two parts. One is the erasure of the stories of the small self and a surrender to a larger possibility. And so it's at the intersection of those things. Does that, does that speak more? Yeah, I think, I think we, yeah, because we can talk about this for a very long time. <laughs> um, let's talk about your work with APBF. It's what, 10 years now? Yes, 10 years. 10 years, okay. And this work of sort of documenting um, poets both on the continent and in diaspora as yeah. well. Um, I wanted you to speak to that, but I think my other quest, second sort of follow-up question to that is also about access. It's one thing to document, but then access to the work, right? Um, and access to the material that has been produced. And, that, and how that... Um, influences this idea around change that we've been talking about. Because you're talking, your, your provocations are that change also happens in really small, interesting ways, more minuscule ways than we can actually fathom or think about. Yeah, I mean, everybody wants a grand mezzanine moment, but that's not possible. I mean, if it was, they nailed the man to the cross already and he didn't do anything. So change is an incremental thing. And so what we're really all aiming for is transformation. But transformation is really just a commitment to sustain changes that can eventually gain enough momentum to lead to a transformation, right? So APBF, years and years ago in London, everybody was a poet. Okay? All of <laughs> all my whole group were all poets, but didn't know anything about it. And Kwame decided to come over because we had no mentorship, all the poets of color, and offered a kind of, there was called the Afro Style School of Poetry. And, um, and, you know, he, he taught it as an African, you know, so there was no politeness. So I remember one time somebody said, he said something about someone's work, and they're like, well, you can't tell me about my work, Kwame. I know everything about my work. And he said, oh, that's interesting. What's your average syllabic count per line? And then they were like, what the fuck is a syllabic count? <laughs> so it was, um, it was groundbreaking, but we realized that what had happened is that a generation before us had, had failed to provide ladders for others to come. And so what would happen is you would see swells of writers from the continent become famous for a moment, because writing is a lot like fashion. And then it would disappear again. So we were on tour in Africa, in Southern Africa. It was called uh, the, the Durban Poetry Center had sent us on a Poetry Africa tour. And we met all these amazing poets, and none of them were published, and none of them could do anything. So we thought, what would be a way to do that? So we instituted this thing where we started with 10 chapbooks per box set, and then we would put out a call, we would get three, 400 manuscripts, we would not try and narrow it down to 10, and then with a, a backup, and then we would, um, we would offer editorial, and some people couldn't stand the heat, and they would fall off, and others would, and then it, we started putting them out, and so even today, when the last poet was reading, you see him making reference to poets within the poetry, so it's created its own world, and it's honest, we don't do anything anymore, really. The poets are driving it. And we chose poetry because even in the US, no one cares about poetry. But I think you'll find for oral cultures, which we are, poetry is the first step before that larger narrative. So that was what propelled that. And we, we look, we work, we work for, for pennies. Like, nobody gets paid. So that's part of the question of access. So even before that, the African Poetry Book Fund, we set up organizations in countries we set up libraries in those countries uh, with these commit run by the writers there, and then we convince people to ship books to them. Um, when you get published by us, the author gets a check in dollars, which doesn't often happen, but we give them between 100 and 200 chapbooks that they can distribute as they like. These books are sent to libraries across the world. So even recently we were in, in Norway and we had to do an event based on these poets and these chapbooks. 
So we're trying always to open up this idea of access. But we're also working on the idea of who has access to culture. So this is a terrible and difficult thing to talk about, but everybody who mostly reads in Africa is a middle class person. And African middle classes like to think that they're the voice of the nation. And so they like to center their concerns as the concerns of the population. And so it's really difficult to figure out a way to get behind that and to do it. And one of the ways we initially tried was to go into African languages. But the other problem with colonialism was that people speak these languages, but they're not literate in reading these languages. And some of them, the orthography is still in, in dispute. So it's a constant negotiation about access. Uh, and then access to festivals, access to being seen, to be heard, uh, and then even access to your own imagination. Because how you asked a question to Remy the other day about competit competitiveness and how when you, every intervention you, you create to open up a path also narrows the path, right? So then the question is how much of them people write in to be published by the African Poetry Book Fund because they, they think they've cracked the aesthetic code. Um, but the beautiful thing about that series is that in spite, we do it all blind submissions, we don't know the names. In fact, even the contracts will go out when we've selected a book and people come up to me like, oh, you sent me a contract. I was like, I don't, I don't know you, man. <laughs> Because we try to make it, and without trying, it's 80% female. The biggest problem we have is how to weed out the Nigerians, because, <laughs> because it tends to be 90% Nigerian. Um, so so it's, it's a constant struggle. You can't get access right. But what we are, what we, the aim of what we do is to be more than anything an aperture, and that people come through APBF, they get into programs in the US, they get scholarships, they go on to run magazines, create their own journals, they're doing it on the continent. And so what, all we're trying to do is to facilitate a conversation that hasn't happened properly, which is African writers don't really know African literature. Mm -hmm. It's in different languages, they're not translated. We just sat in that room and we were talking about this problem. So it's an ongoing thing. It's, uh, but the idea, as you're about to say, <laughs> one, <laughs> one, ten, ten, one ten, small, 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 will make dense. So, so speaking about this, right, so you've, you're doing a lot of work with the African Poetry Book Fund. Um, you're also a professor yourself, so you're also teaching. Um, it's, it's very, you know, I, I, I mean, I think that, you know, creating can be a very selfish practice. And to have to also move from, move from this to um, administrator and a kingmaker... <laughs> in some way. I'm interested in knowing how this affects your own writing practice and creative practice, both in terms of time and just emotional, the emotional aspects of it. Yeah. Okay, so I love that we've just been asking easy questions all the way through. Mm -hmm. When are you going to ask me about my makeup routine? <laughs> These are very important things to know. Um, so here's the thing. The hardest thing I do is administration. And I was selfish and waited until I was I was sort of an endowed professor. I am an endowed, not sort of. Which means that even the president of the university can't fire me without severe consequences. And then I took over admin. Because until you, when you're faculty, and I'm going to apologize to all the administrators here, you don't know how crazy faculty are. So when you become the administrator, you're like, is this you, John? It's, it sort of becomes like you find that you're more like, it's more like running play school. So, so that has been hard because my tendency is African dictatorship. Like if I had my way, it's, it's a good thing I'm not in the army. Because I'd be like, okay, you firing squad, you firing squad. Fire this one, hire that one. So that has been the most difficult thing because to create, because we work in a system that is actually strangely vertical bands, to try to create a consensus along vertical bands each believing that their own interest is the predominant interest has been the most tasking part of anything I've ever done. So that obviously means that there's no time to write books. Teaching is also difficult because when you teach, as I do creative writing, um, I get really invested in the students' work, so you're reading a lot of that. Um, but here's the thing about writing. There is the, the writing life, and then there's being a writer. 
And so by that I mean the writing life is sort of the romantic life, you know? Because everybody who gets to know Chris is always disappointed because they think, oh, I'm so smart, I'm so erudite, wow, you write so well. And if people have even dated me and then realized that I don't actually run salons in my house, I don't know Jean-Paul Sartre, and then they find out that I just eat ice cream all the time, so it's not very interesting. So I think the craft, is, craft and the actual writing is 50% personality. If you're someone who likes things to be orderly and you will not allow a pen to be askew, then you have to do it every day. And, but if you're like me, who's intrinsically lazy, you figure out that 50% of your process is if you play with ideas for a long time, then one day you take three months off and it comes together. So that's the way to defeat it. But look, I have almost 16 books in the world. I don't think anybody is bereft if I don't write another book. <laughs> You know, like, the reason I have a two-year-old, right, I'm 56 with a two-year-old, is because I have siblings, and between them there is 11 nieces and nephews, so I figured the Barneys didn't need another motherfucker running around. <laughs> so, so I think that that's what it is. I think I've come to the place now where I'm happy to go 10 years between books, because when I was starting off, I had everything I wanted to say. And now I've realized that there are only actually a few things worth saying. Yeah. And then if I don't have a book that says that thing, I won't publish it. So books, public, manuscripts litter my house that I don't bother sending out. Because it's like, that's just another way of saying the other thing you said over there. So. Um, I wanted to go back to the provocations, right? And I wanted to talk about this idea of truth again writers and this speaking truth to power and again belaboring and burdening them with these sorts of things and you talk about how you know it, you're not really interested in truth and their multiples um, or they change over time and for me I'm usually interested in honesty because I find that I just find that more interesting and more more murky and I like murky stuff I like I like the you know the grotesque and the beautiful side by side I, I find that more interesting than this idea of of moral superiority of what truth is and speaking truth. And I wanted to kind of know your, just your stand on it, your thoughts on it, on this idea of a truth, multiple truths, my truth, um, and what honesty really, you know, means for you in terms of that in connection to writing and what you think that does to, to writing. Wow, okay, so, but we'll get to makeup, right? Make sure, okay. we'll get to your skincare routine, don't worry. Right. Truth, truth. Here's the thing, there is no such thing. Um, and there's no such thing as multiple truths either. Truth is, truth is a virus, right? So by that I mean that it is something that is constantly evolving and every time you try to check it, it will adapt to the vaccination and become something else. It will travel from person to person, culture to culture and change. And this is actually what makes a very successful poem is that a poem becomes a simulacrum of a body, a virus, so to speak, that will not be contained. So if you take something like a poem by Hafiz, 13th or 12th century uh, Sufi, and Sufism comes out of Zoroastrianism, not Islam, encounters Islam, which is more abstract, and Zoroastrianism is all about the beloved. And so Sufi, Sufi writers are being persecuted, and he writes a simple poem, um, which you then see people walking around Los Angeles, in their annoying uh, Lululemon clothes, namaste in at you all the time. Um, and they love to quote this poem. And so the fact is, it's a simple poem. It's called This Sky in Which We Live. And it simply goes, this sky in which we live is no place to lose your wings. So love, love, love. 900 years ago, this is a call to action to Sufi poets to not bow to tyranny. And now, Karen in Los Angeles quotes it as her transformational mantra. So outside of the context, the poem still travels. It still retains the thing that makes it a robust work of art, but like a virus, it mutates to survive in the current space, right? So that's what I think about poetry, and I think, and, and, and good poetry, and what I also think about truth. I like the idea of honesty. Here, here's the thing about honesty is it's very tricky. Because what we're really discussing is the idea or the difference, which doesn't even get talked about, between information and intimacy. 
So a writer should always try to create intimacy, but writers get lost in information. Here's a bad example of that. I'm not going to quote writers because, you know, I, I, I didn't bring my Kevlar. But um, I was standing in a coffee shop in Starbucks in, in California, and there were two young women in their valley vocal frying when they like talk like that. And one of them says, so like my therapist says that the reason I'm a narcissist is because like my father sexually abused me as a child. And this is very loud. And so two things happen in Starbucks. There are the people who are like, oh shit, I just came for coffee. La, 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 la. And there are people who are like, oh my God. And in that moment, Here's the thing if your body has been interfered with. It is complicated because the body can betray the heart and the mind. Like you, your body can respond to something that is intrinsically wrong to you. And that is the real betrayal that people who go through in these things are trying to negotiate. So one is information and everybody thinks they have access to it. But that inform if she had gone, if she had had an, a moment where her therapist allowed her to have an intimate encounter with that experience. First of all, she wouldn't talk about it in Starbucks. She wouldn't talk about it so easily. And that is where the struggle is. It's this, this, this thing between vulnerability and the de burning desire to speak sometimes, but even your own body choking the words from coming out of your mouth. So, so I think that that's what I prefer is intimacy. It's difficult because if you were, as a writer, a writing a character who's a rapist, you have to not just imagine that, but embody the potential of that and write it in a way that if you leave the room yourself, you need a shower. That's why I always tell young writers, there's Chris and there's Chris Abani. There's a writer and there's you. Because if you go in as you, you can't deliver the work, you will judge the characters, you will not be able to do the thing. So I, I prefer honesty because honesty is a difficult thing to negotiate. And it always means that as much as is possible, every side of the situation is touched upon and there's no easy resolution. So for me, intimacy is really the pathway. It is the most difficult thing. And we witnessed it even here on the stage when, when our brother read in English and then we asked him to read in Portuguese, you saw the switch from information straight into intimacy and everybody sat forward in their seats. So that's what I mean, it's an embodiment of difficulty. Um, how much time do we have before we can go for questions? We still have, what, 10 minutes. Oh, okay, I think we should open it up because we have about 10 minutes left. Do you have any questions? Please just go to the microphone. I'm scared because we were just having an argument <laughs> in the other room. <laughs> uh, so, Chris, in India, there's this man uh, who's taken his parents to court. I'm speaking about. Can you? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. So, in India, there's this man who's taken his parents to court because they gave a birth to him without his permission. Uh, so, to me, that speaks perhaps of a moment of loss. And in the back room you were talking about the transition from sorrow to melancholy. I think it was, right? Um, can you expand on that? Because I think you've also mentioned it, uh, that for me as well as a writer, my career, my writing has completely changed when I accepted loss as part of my daily routine. So can you expand a little bit about loss, but also about that kind of transition between the, the sorrow and melancholy and how we could, um, we could yeah. I think I, I think I get what you're asking. So um, here's the thing. Somehow in the modern world we live in, we have been led to believe that there's value in not having pain. But these same people also like to quote Rumi, who is a Sufi mystic, and Rumi says, the wound is where the light enters. You hear this all the time, and people will always follow it with a kind of, ha ah, moment. The wound is essential. All human life is based on friction. If there is no friction, there is no growth. It's impossible. 
you wouldn't do anything. So the idea, everything, there is no benign form of parenting. There's no benign form of anything. The most wholesome form of parenting still has to say, stop, here, stop. There, there are dragons. I know you want to go there, but you can't. So no is an imperative part of it. The idea that you would sue someone for giving you a name. Look, I went to a parenting class, and I was told that before I change the diaper of my infant, I should ask her consent. I was like, you what? So if my daughter at nine months needs my consent to change her diaper, then she's old enough to change her own diaper. Change her diaper. Because I think that there is a point at which conversations go from things that are actually rigorous into a whole fantasy. Because that kind of curation of the world is a kind of fascism. And if every, the whole world has to be curated just for you, and there's seven billion of us, well, how is that even possible? So the whole idea I think about this is that everybody is born into a wound, not wounded, a wound. Because wounds are bleeding, wounded are infestations of pussy. And that friction to figure out how deep, what are the dimensions, is where all things come from. Mathematics, science, the need to see the universe, all of that is, this, is the program that is built into human subconscious of expansion. And expansion necessarily, to force itself, must do that. So I, but sorrow is one thing. Melancholy is a different thing. Melancholy is a natural, beautiful state of humans, which is when you, when you hurt yourself and you get a scab, do you know that moment when it starts healing, when it's really delicious to scratch it, and you scratch it, and then the scab lifts, and then blood appears, and then there's that, ooh, but still a kind of sweet oof, that is what melancholy is. All of Charlie Parker is melancholy. All of John Coltrane is melancholy. So melancholy is not a sad thing, it's a bittersweet thing. And I think that the natural state of humans is bittersweet, which means you're always poised on the edge of some kind of loss and some kind of gain, some kind of trans movements across different parts of your personality. So to arrest it is to not be human. And it's, it serves no one. That's it's sentimental. It just doesn't, doesn't, it's not useful. And so people have to make mistakes. People have to fail. And people have to offend the other people. The, not because they want to offend you, but you've chosen to be offended. And that's okay, but no one died from being offended. Well, unless I have a gun and I'm the administrator, then people might die. But what I mean by that is that the entire process of being human is trying to negotiate difficulty into a space of transformation. Right? So even the, all the questions I remember I'm not just getting about why are you doing this, why do you write that, but it's like, what are you talking about? That is, that is life. So, so I think that that's what I meant by that, the way look, and all, all languages contain it. One of the, you know, German is a problematic language only in the sense that you know, Turkish people have lived there for over 100 years, probably 100 years, but the language remains pristine. It's a kind of nationalistic thing. But German is one of the few languages that has actual words for things like the nostalgia for a thing you have never experienced. That's what most people are talking about when they're talking about their suffering. They're really just talking about a thing they've never experienced. Because pain is not the same as suffering and all that. Well, that's the whole, when I come as guru, in my guru outfit, we can have that conversation. Do we have any more questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, I think my question is mostly related to um, your keynote speech. Um, where, and also the first questions that Wana asked about um, the writer as this, you know, sentimental you know, embodiment of change or the writer as, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you get what I mean. But I'm, I, I completely agree with that. But I'm also thinking about the writer as not just an artist, but the writer as a citizen. Um, and I think that citizens do carry by design, because you are existing under this you know, network of power relations and all that, have the potential to at least seek change. Um, so what would you say, or what would you speak to that writer as citizen and you know, using the um, pen, as they say, um, as a way to sort of articulate the 
kind of experience that a citizen would have? That's a good question, but I think you answered it. Here's the thing. Writer is a role, citizen is a role, husband is a role, so, but you are none of those things. These are just roles you enact. So there's no such thing as a writer citizen. There is a citizen who also writes, right? So then a writer bears no more responsibility to, to citizenship than citizens do. And I have to tell you that writers have the privilege of narrating what they see. There are, when Oprah, it's funny I should bring up Oprah, right? When Oprah was giving out money in her angel network, she gave money to this group of uh, grandmothers in Chicago because these women, with their pensions and with no government help, no interventions, would go into crack houses and take babies out and raise them on their meager pensions. That is much more powerful and important than anything I can say about how powerful and important it is. There is action and there are words. You see what I'm saying? So I do more as a citizen, as Chris, than I, I think it's a citizen as writer. Writer carries a different function. Just like father is a different function, mother is a different function. I think that there's a tendency, particularly a recent Western idea, where identity is imported from the outside. So people say things like, I'm a vegetarian. You're not a vegetarian. You're John, and you eat vegetables. Because the re a vegetarian is an ideology, and there are different meanings within that one word, right? So I think that the problem often for writers is they keep saying, I'm a writer. They should say, I'm Chris. I also write. Because the moment you set yourself up as a writer, then you create all the neurosis of delivering or what of a romantic perception. So in other words, Chris Abani, I never know. When people come and say, hello, Chris Abani, I don't know who they're talking about. That's the piñata they've created, uh, an effigy. That has nothing to do with me, and I try to respect it as much as I can. Uh, I think that's what Wale was trying to speak to here the other day, too. We're just people, man. The only gift we have is that we tell good lies. That's it. Hello. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to see you, Chris Abani. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's a question. When you were talking about um, you enter your writing as Chris, and then there's Chris Abani, the person, it made me think of a very, very problematic um, concept of the negative capability of writers. And it also made me think of Nabokov and how that he has made a career of writing very, very creepy kinds of characters. And, yeah, and, and I, I wanted to find out if the idea of being Chris and then being Chris Abani is to inhabit a certain amoral space as a writer in which you could write about any particular um, character without judging them. Because then, if that is the case, when is it too far? you know, too far from what is supposed to be done, or is there supposed to be a kind of limit? Yeah, that's the question. Okay, um, good question. So here's the thing. Th this idea of the writer being above morality is a quote from Nietzsche, and if you knew Nietzsche, he shouldn't have been saying anything, really. Um, but it, it has been interpreted, particularly by male writers, to suggest that there's an artistic license to behave badly, right? So be an alcoholic and abuse people. In the case of Nabokov, make your wife write the book and then pretend you wrote it. Um, and all these kinds of things that happen. So that is of little interest to me. I follow, I'm more interested in ethics. And ethics is a position you have to take that can counteract your morality. So morally, you may be opposed to abortion, but ethically, you have no right to interfere with another person's morality. So what a writer should try to do is to create a complicated story where a complicated issue can be talked about without resorting to easy stereotypes. It's disturbing in some cases, and it isn't disturbing in some cases. The difference is this. When someone like Nabokov writes, he doesn't put a moral order in, and when you watch a detective show, they put a moral order in. All detective shows start with women being murdered. Have you noticed that? So let's not even talk, I know my undergrad men, they're always writing about murdered women, they chop their bodies up, they put them in bags and they bury them. So the first question I ask them is, if you were going to chop up a body, where would you cut to drain the blood? And how long would that take? And what would you mix to make the blood flush the drain? Because blood turns to jello. And all this, and they, you realize how people haven't, they talk about morality, but they just, it's all glib. So here's what I think, that if I stop being Chris, then I don't live in the world. 
I live in the construction of a writer. There is no limit to what a writer can, should, write, doesn't write, men writing women, white people writing black people. The only thing you owe is to do the best possible work to render a complete individual on the page. That's it. So if you do that, I don't have to like it, but I don't think you shouldn't do that. That's my answer to that. And I think this, we come to the end of the conversation. Thank you very much, Chris Abani. Wow, thank you so much. Looks like uh, you've left us with uh, a lot more to think about than uh, <laughs> we, 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 we've had. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so you can take a seat. Yes. <laughs> photo time. Shall we call to the podium Her Excellency Harriet Thompson, British High Commissioner to Ghana. Thank you very much and welcome, Madam. Good evening, everybody. You know, I, I speak in front of much bigger crowds than this very often, and it doesn't bother me in the least. And now I'm terrified. <laughs> what can I possibly say that's going to be worth listening to more than the conversation? I'm sure I wasn't the only person sitting in the audience wishing that the conversation wasn't going to end. It was absolutely fascinating. Thank you, both of you. Um, it's an, it's an honour, it might be terrifying, but it's a great honour to have been asked to speak at this conference. Um, I've only been here for a couple of hours this weekend, and it's just so fascinating and interesting to hear not only about the craft of writing, about which I know absolutely nothing, um, but the purpose of writing and the power of writing and the ideas that it can open up, um, help us reflect on further, but perhaps more importantly, bring to us for the first time. So thank you just for the few people that I've heard speak. It was absolutely brilliant. I want to, first of all, start by congratulating Accra, Ghana, for being um, UNESCO's world book capital this year. Well done, Accra. Um, well done, Accra, for hosting... This is the second literary festival that Accra has hosted in as many weeks, and that is really something. So well done for that. Um, and of course, well done, and a huge thank you to NYU Accra. NYU Accra. Yes, Frank is like clapping loudest, of course. But it's not just Professor Frank. We heard just now from, um, I was about to say Charles, I'm sorry. <laughs> But you, you talked at the beginning about all of the many people who've been involved in putting an event on like this. And we see what's sort of within the marquee and we tend to forget about the millions and millions of other people who've um, helped to, to get this going. The very fact that there are all of those people who want to invest their time in organizing an event like this, I think is something that we should all be deeply grateful for. Um, the themes that you've pulled out, the themes that were pulled out in the poetry that I heard before this last conversation um, make, have made me reflect pretty deeply. And one of the things that particularly struck a chord, I think, is when you talked about access and how important it is for events like this to increase access so that more and more people are exposed to the wealth, exposed to the value that there is in literature and poetry and writing of all types. Just to pull us back down out of that literary sphere and into statistics, um, around the world, 250 million children don't acquire basic skills. Right here in Ghana, 80% of children finish primary education without basic literacy skills. And that shuts off all of this to them. It shuts it off. And so as we're thinking about promoting 
literature, promoting the craft of writing, promoting the, the value that we recognize in writing. We've got to, got to, got to hold on to the crucial importance of opening that access at the very basic level by helping people to read, helping people to read in their own languages as well. So important. Um, so look, I, I just want to sit back down again and listen to more interesting people speak. <laughs> so let me stop there by uh, congratulating everybody who's taken part, uh, thanking NYU Accra, thanking all of the amazing authors. When I looked at the program for this event, it's just awesome. And I've already had a starstruck moment sitting next to one of, one of the authors. Uh, it's one of a few starstruck moments I've had in this very establishment with some of the incredibly impressive authors that you're able to bring here. So congratulations for all you do. Please keep doing it. Everyone, please keep coming. Thank you very much, Harriet. We really appreciate your presence. Thank you. Thank you. At this uh, juncture, shall we call on one of the uh, main people at NYU Abu Dhabi to give us a closing statement? Shall we call on Mariette Westerman, Vice Chancellor, NYU Abu Dhabi, New York University? Well, good evening, everyone. Hello, everyone. Well, um, if Her Excellency Harriet Thompson had a hard time speaking after all that we've heard. Have a little heart for your humble Vice Chancellor, who of course has heard even so much more in the last three days. It has been an absolutely magnificent um, event here, thanks to the fantastic writers, publishers, editors, professors, scholars, students, the wonderful people at NYU Accra who helped, uh, those many volunteers from the students who are here, and of course, especially and above all, thanks to the incomparable Frankie. Thank you, Frankie. My great colleague at NYU. You've heard from me a couple of times already, so today I, I want to say even just a very tiny bit because one of the wonderful things we heard is many great sayings from the different literatures of the African continent. And growing up in Holland, yeah, I don't know if you've ever been to Holland, but people just speak in proverbs. Proverbs are really deep in our culture and little sayings, entire conversations. And so the way I feel right now is like one of our favorite little sayings, mustard after the meal. Mustard after the meal is something, of course, that shows up after you've had, it, of course, it means that you speak belatedly. You're already belated. You come after the most magnificent, delicious, often here, very spicy meal, and someone shows up with mustard, when really what you should be offering is delicacies, treats, Dutch chocolate, you know, apple pie, something like that. So I'm going to leave you with two little treats that really occurred to me as I listened to so many of these magnificent panels, conversations, discussions. Um, one of them is from more than 2,000 years ago. A wonderful writer and brilliant orator, although we've never heard him speak, we can assume it, the Roman rhetorician Cicero, who said, of the many, many, many things he said, he said, if you have a garden and a library, you have everything. Now, I don't think you really have everything, but it really occurred to me that in this wonderful campus that really is a garden full of houses that have histories of people in them, we not only had a library, the library came alive because we had these 35 wonderful writers. Uh, some of whom, indeed, I had long hoped to meet myself. I had that same experience you did. And uh, many of whom I've gotten to know and we heard maybe for the, and began to read maybe for the first time. And so there's nothing like a library with a living, a garden with a living library in it. And so the garden also gave us great respite. So thank you for creating that with you and your pre predecessors, uh, Frankie. And the last thing I want to say is that it is wonderful to listen and learn and experience aesthetic pleasure. We talked about all sorts of pleasure, but aesthetic pleasure is a particular kind of pleasure of listening to really good writing and speaking. And I think that is so necessary in this world. We live in a very difficult world, we know it. We have 
climate change, uh, always, we're always forgetting about it again because war and violence erupt, as we know. Uh, economic and other dislocation, migration, that is not so welcome in many places. It's really hard. We live in a hard wor world. And then to hear from all of you uh, in this forward-looking way, dealing honestly with the past, really, and with the challenges of our time, but also always deeping, digging back deep into your writerly and aesthetic beings, really, your creative beings, to give us hope, um, really was just one of the great experiences for me. And as an art historian, I am a great admirer of the painter Gerhard Richter. And Gerhard Richter, post-war German painter, who of course came out of a very painful history himself, likes to say, and has kept believing it to this day, that art is the highest form of hope. So thank you for giving us so much beauty and so much hope. Thank you so much, Maria. That was incredibly wonderful. Thank you very much. So, usually after an event like this, we would have vote of thanks or show of gratitude. But we need somebody to come and show gratitude to the person who is going to give us the gratitude. So I'll call on, call on Kina to give us a little bit of a gratitude to thank you. He said it nicely, but I bullied my way in. Um, Frankie. When um, Frankie told my mother and I that he was going to be the director at NYU Accra, we were excited um, because he is such a fantastic human being. But then he took over and then one day he said, oh, we're going to use the garden space. You know, there's such wonderful space. I, we'll have talks. And then he said, we'll call it Laboni Dialogues. And from the very first Laboni, I've been to several, moderated many. And now here we are. I personally want to thank Frankie for creating this space in Ghana and for those of us who are into the arts in Accra. Every single one of the Laboni dialogues has been exceptional. Whether he's talking about music, about individual works of art, bringing, I mean, He's bringing writers from out of Ghana. And we want to, and I'm also here because I want to thank where the NYU people. Thank you very much for supporting him. It has, this space has made such a difference to, um, in, in, in my language, they say our chiche, which is, can be loosely um, translated as comforting, right? So just thank you, Frankie. Thank you so much. That's all I have to say. Thank you, thank you very much. So I guess um, we, can, we can call on Frankie now to say um, a few words of gratitude to all us. <laughs> few. Where's the village? Where's the village people? Come, 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 we have executives here and serious people. Come, 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 come. Everybody, come, 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 come. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Come, 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 Dr. Nick, where are you? There you go, there you go. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All of my white shirt people, I see you. Come on up. It's okay. Don't be shy. No one's going to bite. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Um, just a few words of gratitude. It does take a village, and this is a minuscule part of our village. There are so many people who are just overjoyed to work with us, our community here in Laboni, our volunteers, our team. When we actually started thinking of the idea of bringing all of these wonderful people to Ghana, they all told me we could do it. The truth is, when I first got here, um, I really, really, really wanted to get Chris Sabani to NYU Accra, and it has happened, and I'm so happy. I'm so happy. 
the idea that so many other people could have said yes to us to come here has just made us feel like we are even more on cloud nine than we were. I have to take a moment to thank those people who always take our calls here at NYU Accra. We are part of a global network university which is very, very, very large which means that there are so many people who do great things. But there's one or two people who we would not be here without. And the first of those champions is a guy named Professor Awam Angba. Yeah. <laughs> he is here somewhere, I believe. But we, there he is. We literally would not be in this garden if not for him. He has had many jobs at NYU. He's currently the Vice Provost for the Arts and the Dean of the Arts and Humanities, but Awam always takes a call from NYU Accra. Whether we want to cry, complain, bitch, moan, he has always been there for us. Another person who has always been there for us and always gives us a hard time but shows his love for us is a professor named Benga Ugidengbe. Professor Banger is a medical doctor and he has a heart. And he's wearing white. Oh, God. We will never forget all of the times that he has answered our call on short notice and been extremely kind to us. Our most important champion who really wanted to be here but could not, and I hope you take the time to read her message, is our incomparable president, Linda G. Mills. Despite a packed schedule, she told me she was coming to Accra, can't make it, but she has been here before, and she would really, really enjoy coming back. So thank you, Linda, for all you've done for us here. What is it that could happen with a symposium? The ideas are there, but you need money, cash money, and I don't have any, and it's very difficult. But thankfully, people like my boss, Elliot Borenstein, and Global Programs gave us the seed money to take this further and further away. And then we had so many units at NYU, and they're all in the program, who really, really helped us to bring the writers here, to keep them here, and to make this a wonderful time for us. NYU Accra is in and of the city, so we are a community. And our community partners, some of you were at the theater yesterday, and you met Latif Abubakar of Globe Theatre. He is one of our partners who is always so very kind. Another partner of ours who has been very quiet in the back is Patricia Wilkins, the force from Queens. And she has been selling you those book bags to go along with those books that you're buying. Her organization, Basics International, has been at the forefront of teaching children how to read, which is a thing that we all want. Books saves lives. And everyone who's been in a class of mine knows that I start the class by saying, books saved my life. So we really need to turn the pages. Um, our dear friend, Kuku Klenam, I don't know if he's still around, but he was. Yay, Kuku! Socialite AF. A quiet gentleman, but is always very helpful. I personally could not do this job without 100% love and support from my dear friend, his Excellency, Charles Abani, the United Nations Resident Coordinator, who simply does not let me whine and moan and helps me to just get on with it whenever I'm down and has always been at all of our Laboni dialogues, even when we don't announce him. So, Oga Charles, <laughs> we thank you so much. And today we have brought your brother, so. <laughs> all of us here at NYU Accra are supremely grateful to all the brilliant, brilliant writers, or people who write, since we are learning from Olga Chris. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, who have answered the call and who came here. You guys have given us a blueprint, and we hope that we're going to build up our writing community from all of the inspiration we've taken from you. I thank you all. NYU Accra thanks you all. So please, come back and see us again. We love you. Thank you so very much to everyone. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. The book stand is still open, even though the uh, discussions are over, the book stand is open. Buy a book, 
read a book and book your place in heaven. Thank you all so much. There will be, to all the delegates, there will be a bus outside that's going to pass you to the um, thank you reception dinner. Some I just want to have 